in three weeks, we come to Advent, which is the beginning of the church year. That means in these next three weeks, counting today, we are closing out our reading through of the gospel according to Matthew. Each gospel has its own, its own special way of painting a portrait of Jesus Christ. Matthew has a certain charm to it for me, a certain logic that is absolutely enchanting. Matthew wants us to understand Jesus' life against the background of the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, the five books of Moses. In fact, he divides up his gospel into five sections, five teaching sections interspersed with, uh, with Jesus' ministry actions. He, the first word in his gospel is Genesis. His main character, Jesus, he portrays him as a new Moses. He is rescued as an infant from a king who would kill him. He is then sent as a child into Egypt so that he can be brought out, called out like Israel was. The first chapter of the book of Matthew is full of names, just like the third book of the Bible, Numbers. The fourth book of the Bible, Numbers. The, the, the third book of the Bible, Leviticus, is all about the holiness of God. And in Jesus' teachings, it is, it is his teaching that you shall be holy even as the Lord your God is holy. And then the fifth book of, of, the, uh, of the Bible, Deuteronomy, ends with two mountains, a mountain of blessing and a mountain of cursing. And the children of Israel are told, choose carefully which mountain you are going to stand on. And it so happens that Matthew has Jesus taking us up onto a mountain at the beginning of his gospel to give us the blessings of what it is to know God and to live with him. And that's at the beginning of his first section of teaching. And here in Matthew 23, at the beginning of the last section of teaching, Jesus comes to us with the woes that are similar to the curses in Deuteronomy. So in Deuteronomy, half the, tri half the nation of Israel was, to, was told before they would go into the promised land to go stand on the mountain of Gerizim and to read there the blessings of life with God. If you love God, and if you love your neighbor, here are, all, here are the ways that things are going to go well for you. The other half of Israel was told to go stand on Mount Ebal, and there were the curses. Here is what happens, and it will not be good if you do not love God, and if you do not love your neighbor as yourself. And here in the, here as Jesus begins to finalize his teaching ministry with his, with his people. He recalls the blessings of the Sermon on the Mount and contrasts them with the curses of what happens if we do not yield to that life. So I'd like to, I'd like to go through five of those pairings so that you and I can get a sense of how wonderful it is to climb the mountain of blessing, to experience the, the, the clear, clean air and the, and the line of sight that lets us see reality for what it is, and to contrast that with the portrait that Jesus gives us here in Matthew 23, in these verses and in the rest of the chapter, of what it is to go up on the, the, the clouded mountain where there is the smell of the smoke of hell, and where, think of Sauron in, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, where all you can sense is decay and despair, and where the hell that is, awaits at the end of time for those who do not obey is lived out in the now. Jesus begins the Beatitudes by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What that means for me is one, as I look to Jesus, who has come 
not to exalt himself and not to come and stress his own importance, but the importance of others. What has Jesus so upset about the teachers of his day is that they're just in it for the front row seats, for the perks of the job, for the titles. Now, I wish that we didn't have titles. I would love to live in a world in which we could all just be brother and sister. The fact of the matter is, titles and rank and privilege will come. And some, like Elizabeth II, will take a crown even though she doesn't want it and will, will wear it graciously and in service to others. Others in a society like that of Joseph Stalin will insist that everybody's the same, everybody is comrade, but that doesn't keep him from being a murderous tyrant. What Jesus wants is for us not to let our titles define us, but to put our eyes to, to, to not breathe in the toxic smoke of self-service, but to climb the mountain of blessing and realize that all of our needs have been met in Jesus Christ. As my friend Larry Crabb used to, used to like to say, we all crave security that is to be loved, and we crave significance that is to be important. But those only come as gifts. And when we receive them as gifts, we don't have to think of ourselves as being more important than we are, but we can care for the people around us and help them to know their importance to God. Secondly, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be satisfied. He came, touched with our afflictions, weeping at the tomb of, at the tomb of his friends, and calls us to have a heart for people who are, are lonely and sad and who don't understand. On the mountain of woe are those who are impatient with those who do not understand. He talks about the teachers who just lay on assignment after assignment and are bullies. I, as a teacher, I came to see that there, there are, that good teachers remember what it is not to know and, and come alongside, are touched with the afflictions of those who don't get it and figure out how to help them understand. And they find themselves on a common journey to greater knowledge. Other teachers, insecure of who they are, having, having paid however much to get their doctorate, make sure that everybody calls them doctor, but they don't really care if the students get it. They just care that they earn their tenure. Third, Jesus invites us up to the to the mountain of where there is clear air and where we can see him meek and tethered and given to obedience to his father, to carry through Israel's story in grace and in humility so that there would be glory and perfection for the human race. Jesus pillories those who will cross the sea to make disciples, but not for God's story, but for their own story, and make them twice as fit for hell as they are themselves. And I came to know as a teacher, and I know as a, as a priest and a teacher in the church, that the meek life is the life that is tethered to the authority of Scripture, God's story, and to the great tradition that has that has encapsulated that and crystallized it in terms of like the, the creed and the confessions that make it clear and understandable and doable. And it's another thing to use the classroom and the pulpit as a way of creating a following for yourself to make people's disciples of you and your religion of self. 
And Jesus says, leave that mountain. Blow out that smoke because it comes from hell. And join me on the mountain of clear vision and fresh air. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will have an eye to how they will promote worship that is true, that has people loving God and pays attention to the important things and not the mere external things. Whereas others treat the altar and the temple and the gifts cynically. So, you know, it's one thing in the church to, to operate in, in a place even as beautiful as this and to continue to have in mind that it's not about the gold and the gifts, the beautiful stained glass, the amazing organ, but it's about the God whose light shines in and through the stained glass, whose song is amplified in the organ, and who is himself worthy of the, of the gold. And it, it's another thing to manipulate people into supporting, to supporting your ego. Coming out of a capital campaign, I am so mindful of, the, of the, the heart of people in this church that get it, that are grateful for a place like this, that they can invest in, not so that they can have their name on a plaque, but so that the name of Jesus Christ can be forwarded into the next generation. Not a single person who offered a gift in this, camp, in this capital campaign that we have just completed asked to have their name alongside their gift. They just wanted God's people to know that they love them and they love their Lord. And it's one of the things that makes me so grateful for being at this place. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Jesus says, come up to the mountain of blessing with me and Taste what it is to receive God's mercy, because when you do that, then you will know to be generous and to give, to share. Leave the mountain of woe, where the smoke that comes from hell makes you just pay attention to, am I paying my religious tax? Have I set aside my 10% of the garden herbs? Now, it's not that the Lord doesn't care about the 10%, but he says, if you're doing those things and your heart is still so full of greed and avarice that you don't care about the deeper things like love, justice, mercy, well, then you've lost the whole thing and you're totally deluded and you do not see reality for what it is. And so, please, as you, if you're a part of this church and you consider how you might contribute for the next year, and as uh, we're in our fall stewardship campaign, please hear us not asking you to follow some legalistic rule that it's not, nobody's counting. What we want you to do is to leave that mountain and, and the smoke from hell and to come to the mountain of blessing where the air is clear, where you can breathe deeply and breathe in the breath of God that has come to you with the mercy of the blood of Jesus Christ, and then simply respond out of love to the fact that He owns you and everything about you, and then just be generous, care for the people around you, and care as you can for your church. And finally, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God come up to the mountain where you know that you have been so profoundly loved, and you have come to bear the name of the, as a child of the King, so that your love can be pure from Him, and then that every person you see will be 
a portrait to you of the God in whose image you were made and that they are made. And you can be there for them and not they there for you. So that every person you meet does not become a tool for you, but you become a tool in God's hand to further their purity. Leave, leave the smoke-filled mountain where the air that you breathe and the darkness around you lets you see nothing but your own desires and your own need to use people and to manipulate them to help your career or to compensate for love that you have never felt for yourself so that everything is clouded. Every, every motive is not just mixed, but is profoundly corrupt and you do everything that you can to corrupt other people. You don't have to live there. The mountain of woe does not have to be who you are. Come, join me and receive the purity that flows even from the hems of my garment, that your desires may be made pure and that you may love God with a pure and a whole heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Let me close by praying once again the collect that we prayed at the beginning of our service. My deepest desire in my heart is that we together forswear the mountain of woe and climb together the mountain of blessing where Jesus stands with open arms calling us to himself. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift that your faithful people offer you true and laudable service. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.